Warm summer greetings to you all. I have selected Psalm 145 among our lectionary readings to be the focus of this message today. It is about the praiseworthiness of God and his unmatched greatness in the world. In the first few verses, David instructs his people to make sure that their children can recite all the great acts and miracles of God. And then in verses 8 and 9, there's that famous text that we often sing, the Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, and rich in love. And then the psalm kind of hinges at verse 13 with this, the Lord always keeps his promises. And then the rest of the psalm are specific ways in which the promises of the Lord are experienced by us. For example, he gives food to those who need it. He satisfies the hunger and thirst of all. He is righteous in everything he does. He's filled with kindness. He is close to all who call out to him. And as the psalm begins to end, he says, he hears the cries for help and rescues them all. He protects all who love him, but destroys the wicked. You could say that uh, we could sum up the whole psalm by saying that the Lord is worthy to be praised because in all regards, he is our shield and defender. He is our protector. I believe this. I have experienced the protective hand of God, and so have my family members, and so have you. If we didn't believe this text, we wouldn't be Christians. None of us would be. Who would follow a God who's powerful enough to protect us? And, and loves us, but chooses not to. But for that very reason, I also struggle with this text. In fact, the great irony here is that Psalm 145 is only one of the texts in the lectionary reading. One of the other ones is 2 Samuel chapter 11, verses 1 to 15. And in liturgical churches, these two passages would be read side by side. So first, the reader would get up and read this text about God's protective care of his people. And then the very next reading would be about how Bathsheba and her husband Uriah experienced unprecedented harm at the hands of the man who wrote Psalm 145. Yes, the one who wrote this psalm about God's goodness and faithfulness and the unique protective quality of his care for his people is the one who does the exact opposite with God's people. Most of us know the story of David and Bathsheba, but for those of you that may not, there was a day in David's life when as the king of Israel, he let his army go to war, but he stayed at home. And one afternoon after his nap, he walked on his palace roof and looked down and saw a woman of unusual beauty bathing. And the text says that he lusted after her. He sent men to find out who she was and found out that she was the wife of a soldier who was fighting in uh, in the particular war that Israel was engaged in. His name was Uriah. He was a Hittite. In other words, he was a Gentile. He was not Jewish. He then sent some men and most likely under armed guard had Bathsheba brought from her house to the palace and David slept with her. Really, he raped her. For whenever a man in power uses his divine authority to take from a woman what is not his to take for his own advantage. It's rape. And it was Nathan the prophet who corroborated that one detail because when he confronted David about what he did with Bathsheba, he told David a parable or a story about a man who stole a female lamb for himself that didn't belong to him, and he killed it and consumed it. 
Remember what David said? That man deserves to die. And Nathan pointed his finger at David and said, you are that man. And then to cover up this great sin, to cover up the pregnancy that resulted, David had Uriah killed. He had him placed on the front line of the battle so that he would die. When word came back to David that Uriah had been killed, David's response was so cold. He said, well, the arrow sometimes kills our men and sometimes others. You'll have to fight harder tomorrow. It's hard to imagine at this point that the David who did these two crimes is also the one who wrote Psalm 145 about the protective nature of God. So here's the question. Did God remove his protective hand from Bathsheba? And did he remove his protective hand from her husband and the baby that she bore to David and ultimately died because of David's sin? Herein lies the great mystery of faith that actually causes some people to walk away from God. And I, I trust you won't walk away from God because of this mystery, but we must grapple with it. This is the challenge that we have to make sense of, that first of all, Psalm 145 is true. God is our shield and protector. God's gracious hand is protecting us at all times. And if he were to remove his protective hand from any of our lives, they would be a lot worse than they presently are. But it does seem that there are times when God, who has also promised that we will suffer in this life, removes some of his protection from us and allows Satan to attack Job and take away his children and his wealth and his health, that God allows all of us to endure abuse. We live in an extremely wicked world where the prince of the power of the air is at work in those who are sons and daughters of disobedience. And so does God protect his people? Yes. Can we trust him daily? Yes, and we must not grow in cynicism, believing that, oh, God really can't be trusted and he doesn't protect his people because he does. But when God does allow suffering to come, we all have to come to the place where we realize that the mystery of divine providence and why God allows certain things to happen to us and to our loved ones is, is above our pay grade. It's above our thinking. His ways are above our ways and his thoughts are above our thoughts. And if we are going to love God throughout our lifetime, we are going to have to learn to love him in the dark or we're not going to love him at all. Mark Peters, our district superintendent, said to me a couple months ago, he said, I'm convinced that the way in which we choose to live with the pain in our lives, it will determine whether we make it to the finish line or not. The other thing that I've come to believe as I've wrestled with this reality in my own life is that I there's so much I don't know about why we suffer, but what I do know is that when God does allow us to suffer, when he doesn't remove the oppressor, he doesn't remove David from Bathsheba's life, when we are deserted and betrayed and abused and at times even killed, God has suffered the same suffering before us. He has suffered with us. And he has chosen as our brother to enter into fellowship with us in our sufferings so that our suffering and his suffering is mingled together. And I also know this, that the man of sorrows who is acquainted with grief is now our great high priest. 
And when we suffer at the hands of unrighteous men and women, Jesus not only carries our sorrows, but he carries us with him to the throne of grace where we receive mercy to help in our time of need. So there are times when God lifts the shield and allows us to suffer unimaginable pain, but he stands with us in solidarity with us, provides his own comforting presence with us. And the other thing that keeps me running with perseverance, the race marked out for me, is that though in this life, some of the deliverance that I would like today that may not come today, it will eventually come tomorrow in the new heavens and the new earth. And then I know that every tear will be wiped away from every eye for the, there will be no more pain and no more suffering and no more death for the former things will pass away. What is not true today will certainly be true tomorrow. And what God has promised today, and we have yet to see the answer to that promise, we will see the answer when the new heavens and the new earth are ushered in. And so in the words of Jesus' brother Jude, until then, build yourselves up in the most holy faith. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Pray in the Holy Spirit and wait patiently for Jesus to bring you to eternal life. Even so, Lord Jesus, come. Amen.